John Loftus was raised in the church, was baptized, he preached for a little while, and then he abruptly left the church. He wrote a book called Why I Rejected Christianity, and in that book he, he basically summarized why he left this way. He said, what has happened to me theologically? He said, the watershed for me and I suspect for others who have changed their assumptions is the factual and the historical reliability of Genesis chapters 1 through 11. That's it. And I wonder how many other people could basically utter those same words. That, that they have a hard time harmonizing what they're learning in a science classroom with what they're reading in the opening chapters of the Bible. Last night I, I left off with an image like this one. Basically sharing with you that we have the genealogy all the way from Adam to Christ. And if you think about the fact that we know it's been approximately 2,000 years from Jesus to us today, you can look at all of that, put it together, and realize, according to the Bible, this earth is not all that old. And yet that's not what we're constantly hearing. We're constantly hearing that things are millions or billions of years old. So what kind of proof do we have? You know, if I were going to try to prove it to you tonight that the Bible and science go hand in hand, how do we do that? Well, let's see. We start with numbers because numbers don't lie. We look at, for instance, population statistics. We've been taking the census long enough to know that every 35 years, the population doubles. So even with famines, wars, diseases, every 35 years, the numbers double. So let's do this. Let's have an experiment where we start with just two people about one million years ago. Now, neglect the fact that evolutionists would say realistically we started about three million. I'm going to play this conservative. We'll say we started a million years ago. 42 years per generation, again, being very conservative, averaging 2.4 kids per family. Again, that's an extremely conservative number because just to stay stagnant, a nation's got to have 2.15 as a fertility rate, meaning every set of, of parents is averaging 2.15 kids. I'm not sure how you have a 0.15 child, but you know what I mean. So with all of that in mind, you do the math, and lo and behold, the population should be, if, if we started a million years ago, 10 to the 5,000th power. That means a 10 with 5,000 zeros after it. Now why is that a big deal? That's a big deal to me because if you look at every part of the known universe, everything we've observed with the Hubble telescope, folks, the entire universe could only hold 10 to the 100th people. I said 10 to the 5,000th. That means for every area the size of a quarter, you'd have about 500 people. And you hope that they use deodorant. Okay, let's do this though. What if we start with just two people about 6,000 years ago? Again, same generation time of 42 years, same average size of family, 2.4 kids per family. You do the math, it comes out, lo and behold, we should have about 8.34 billion. And you say, wow, Brad, that's a whole lot closer. I, you know, your, your numbers are getting better, but still you're too high because we just clicked over about 7 billion. And you're right. But what happened about 4,000 years ago that knocked us back to just eight? The flood. You see, numbers don't lie. Man-made theories might, but the numbers don't. Now, follow-up question to that. Okay, if we all really did come from just Adam and Eve, how do we explain the rainbow of colors we see around us today? I mean, you think about it for just a moment. You look out in a general population, you've got every color imaginable. Now, before I answer this particular question, I want to make sure everybody hears me very clearly on this one. I'm going to use society's definition of race. But realistically, the Bible's pretty crystal clear. There's only one race. That's the human race. 
Society likes to use the word in designating skin colors. Now, we know the skin color is caused by a biological pigment known as melanin. Everybody in this room has got melanocyte cells. The amount of melanin that you have in each one of those cells is a direct result of your mom and your dad. Now, geneticists have come together. They said, okay, we're going to use letters to designate how much melanin somebody has in their skin. This is a dominant trait. So somebody who's very, very dark skinned will use capital letters. Capital A, capital A, capital B, capital B. Somebody who's very, very fair skin will use lowercase letters. Little a, little a, little b, little b. Now, is there a way that we could use two people? We'll call them Adam and Eve and explain all the different colors we see around us? Let's give it a try. Like, for instance, what if we take the first example there on the screen? What if Adam and Eve were both very, very dark skinned? Big A, big A, big B, big B. What would all their kids be? Big A, big A, big B, big B, right? They'd all be very, very dark skinned. Is that what we see around us? No. No? So I, I can look each and every one of you in the eye and tell you, according to this, Adam and Eve weren't real, real dark-skinned people. And you look at me and you say, whoa, Fred, time out, Fred, you, you can't say that. You know, we're, we're living in a politically correct climate. You, you might offend somebody. Well, that's all right. I'm going to offend all of you. Just wait your turn. Okay? How about this one? Were Adam and Eve very, very fair-skinned? Little A, little A, little B, little B. What would all their kids be? They'd be the same. Little A, little B, little A, little B, little B. They'd all be fair skinned. Again, is that what we see around us? No. We know right now about 55% of the world's population is Caucasian, 37% Mongoloid or Asian, about 8% Negroid. You say, okay. What if God started with one dark skin? and one light skin. On the screen behind me, you see what geneticists call a, a Punnett square. It's what they use to predict offspring. So we're gonna say right here across the top that this is Adam. He was dark skinned, you notice the capital letters. Down the left hand side, we'll say this is Eve. Very fair skin, lowercase letters. Inside each one of these 16 boxes, Basically what they're doing is they're taking the genes from mom, genes from dad, combining them. And in this case, they're all right down the middle tail. Is that what we see around us today? No. Nope. You say, Brad, you're running out of options. And you're right. But I still got one more. What if God had started with a mixture? And in science, we call this heterozygous. Two people who have a mixture of these skin color genes. What are the possibilities from just two people with that particular combination? Folks, you can literally get everything from one very, very fair skin, four light tan, six tan, four darker brown, one very, very dark skin for a total of 16 and one very tired mother. Now, folks, I can get you that with just two people. How many walked off the ark? Eight. 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 All right, you give me eight people. You mix in the fact that today we can get in, in planes, trains, cars, and within just a, a few short hours we can be in a new culture. People are marrying between cultures. And you begin to see how we've got such a literal rainbow of colors around us today. And somebody says, wait, time out, uh-uh, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying it because you can't get different colored folks from parents like that. By the way, that particular grouping up there that you see would probably be two individuals who are kind of a, a beautiful mocha color. <coughs> Interesting. What are most people over in the Middle East? About that color, right? 
Why is that an interesting point? It's an interesting point to me because that's where what we call the Fertile Crescent is. Where most of the early biblical history comes from. Now, I, I'm an evidence guy, okay? I'm one of those science guys that likes to really kind of touch it. I, I really want to make sure things are there. And so when somebody says, you know, I, I just don't know if I can believe it, then let's look at the evidence. Like, for instance, this is a young lady named Cheryl Grant. She said, can you guess my secret? Her secret is she's got a twin sister who's black. Likewise, we look at these two children, twins. One is blonde hair, fair skin. The other dark hair, dark skin. You see, the evidence is you really can get a mixture. And somebody says, wait a second, that, that doesn't explain why we have a predominance of, of dark skinned people around the equator and, and light skinned people, for instance, in, in Northern Europe. That's evolution. Well, actually, no, what that is, the way they're teaching it to our kids is actually racism. And let me explain what I mean by that. You open up a biology textbook today. You ask the question, where did man come from? Rather than saying God, they would say something like Neanderthal man, which came from Lucy, who evolved out of the afar region of Africa. So they've got these pictures of these ape-like creatures, lots of hair on them. You ever ask yourself, what color were they? Normally they're portrayed as kind of darker skin. Interesting, in almost every one of those textbooks, they've got white man walking down out of Europe several hundred thousands of years later. You know what that means? They're teaching our kids that white people are further evolved. Now, I don't care how you look at it, folks, that's racism. And yet, the funny thing, we're teaching it to our kids. By the way, let me back that up with fact. The guy who started this whole theory, Charles Darwin, most definitely believed that. His second book was called The Descent of Man. It's one we don't talk about a whole lot. The reason we don't talk about it is because in that book, he very plainly says the dark-skinned people are closer to the apes than the light-skinned folks. Yeah, I'm sure that would go over real good in biology class, wouldn't it? You say, okay, Brad, but you still haven't explained. Why is there a predominance of, of dark-skinned people around the equator? Well, let's see if we can think of a biblical and a scientific reason. Like, if I were to ask you, why were all of the people dispersed? We go all the way back, for instance, to Genesis chapter 11, right? Tower of Babel. Were they, were they dispersed because of skin color or because of language? Remember the Tower of Babel, right? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine about a thousand people right down here, the base of the tower, all different colors. And let's say they all speak Swahili. They all migrate down towards the equator. Who is going to fare better in that environment closer to the sun? The dark skin or the light skinned? The dark skin. And here's why. The melanin that makes their skin dark also protects them from the sun's harmful UV rays. The more melanin they've got, the more protection they've got. So does it make sense after a few short generations, the fair skinned people, they're going to be the ones that get the skin cancers and such. Basically, the dark skinned people, they have an advantage. Yeah. All right, let's flip it. Let's say we've got a thousand people. The base of the tower, they all speak Swedish. All different colors. They all migrate up towards Northern Europe. Is there any reason we can think of why after a few short generations there'd be a, a predominance of, of fair-skinned people there? Yeah. Take a look on the screen behind me. You'll notice Northern Europe doesn't get a whole lot of sunlight. This top map. And we actually need sunlight. We use it to make vitamin D. Without vitamin D, guess what? You don't absorb calcium. If you don't absorb calcium, folks, you've got all kinds of bone disorders. Starting with things like rickets, osteoporosis, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have enough calcium in your system. Guess what? Eventually, you're probably going to perish from it. So here we are up in Northern Europe. They don't get a whole lot of sunlight, so they're not able to make a whole lot of vitamin D. By the way, the melanin that makes their skin dark 
also inhibits your ability to absorb what little sunlight is available. It basically acts like a filter, which is great if you're living on the equator. It's not so great if you're living in a place that doesn't get a whole lot of sunlight. So in those areas, actually folks who are fair skinned have an advantage. Where's the only place on the, the planet where this rule is violated? Where is there a dark skinned people that don't get a whole lot of sunlight? How about the Eskimos? Where do they get their vitamin D from? The fish. You see folks, when you really start looking at this thing, what you realize is the Bible and science go hand in glove. And yet over and over and over what our kids are getting in the textbooks is something like this. Everything came from a, a big bang billions of years ago. In fact, this one says in the closed universe, a big bang may occur once every 80 to 100 billion years. I had a, a youth minister ask me this question one time. He said, Brad, is there any way that maybe God could have used a big bang to get us to where we are today? I, I appreciated his honesty. He was sincerely seeking an answer. Before I answer that particular question, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the science side of the Big Bang. Because in all reality, it's miserable science, folks. In fact, I'll just go out on a limb and tell you, the Big Bang Theory, most astronomers know it's dead. They just don't have another godless theory to replace it with. Now, think about this for just a moment. How many of the textbooks actually explain where the original matter for the universe came from? They don't. My atheist friend that I mentioned last night, what did he say? Everything came from nothing. Where did he get that from? <laughs> we'll take a look. This is a textbook. General Science, Hardcore Brace. It says, in the realm of the universe, nothing really means nothing. Not only matter, energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from this state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion about 16.5 billion years ago. This theory of origin of the universe is called the Big Bang Theory. All right, so here's what I want you to do, okay? I want you to go home, get a box, shake it out, make sure it's completely empty. I want you to duct tape it completely closed so that nothing can get in there. Put it in your closet for 50 years. Leave it completely alone, take it down. After 50 years, you know what you're gonna have? Nothing. Or, as they would say, you're going to have a whole universe. Yeah, all kinds of stuff because that nothing went boom. Okay, well, they, they're smart enough to realize our young people, they're not buying that. So what they've done is they've shrunk the universe down to a little point in space, basically about the size of a pea. And they said everything came from that. In fact, take a look. This is Discover Magazine, April 2002. They say this is the actual size of the universe at 10 to the minus 34 seconds. Take a look at what they say right here. I'll blow it up for you. They said the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero. Not. As it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is this possible? They say, ask Alan Goose. His theory of inflation helps explain everything. All right, we'll ask Alan Goof. He, he gave a, an interview in Omni Magazine where they asked him the question. They said, just how big was this very early pre-inflation or, or pre-Big Bang universe? Look at his answer. He says, amazingly small, about 10 to the minus 24 centimeters across. Smaller, he says, than a proton. Also amazing, it would have contained only about 25 pounds of matter. Okay, what's my next question? Where does 25 pounds come from? Because folks, he didn't really explain the existence of the universe. All he did was shrink it down to 25 pounds, blow some smoke in your face, hoping you didn't see through it. He didn't give you the origin. In fact, this is basically the picture our kids get in their textbook every single year. The idea that within about 3.4 seconds, everything radiated out 
into an ordered universe. You get a, a cosmic explosion, and lo and behold, now we've got the Milky Way. Well, folks, my eight-year-old son was smart enough to realize there's a problem with that. We were driving around my hometown one day, and out of nowhere, I hear him say in the back, Dad, that's kind of dumb, isn't it? I looked over my shoulder, what, what's kind of dumb? He said, to think that you can get an ordered universe from an explosion. I thought, hey, my kid's getting it. I said, Reese, that's absolutely right. I said, can you imagine if we took a stick of dynamite and we put that in your bedroom and we blew it up? He laughed. He said, probably wouldn't look any different, would it, Dad? <laughs> He's right. This would be my son who owns... He owns thousands of torture devices, also known as Legos. <laughs> the reason I call them torture devices, if you've ever stepped on them in the middle of the night without shoes on, you'll understand what I'm saying. But folks, he realized there's a problem with this. Now, he's not old enough yet to understand you're violating the first two laws of thermodynamics. Because, number one, you're creating matter. <laughs> number two, you're going from a chaotic explosion to an ordered universe. How in the world do you, how do you explain that? I, I'm going to let an evolution explain it to you. Paul Davies, in commenting on it, look at what he had to say. He said, the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws. The sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness allows something to come out of nothing. He said it represents a true miracle. My question is, why is that more scientific than saying in the beginning God did it? By the way, we got a bunch of young people in this room. I want to point out a couple of other things that he doesn't explain. How'd you get the first living cell? I mean, think about it. it. Supposedly, everything came from gas and rocks. Where did we get the first living cell from? I was doing a debate one time. I asked a guy. I said, what did the first cell eat? I kid you not. He looked at me. He came up to me after the debate. He said, I never thought about that. I said, well, I bet the cell did. <laughs> By the way, why did that cell come together when science says everything is going towards chaos or disorder? Why would all of the organelles come together and you have a bilipid membrane? By the way, how do we explain the design we see in the universe or in the human body? You see, there's a lot of stuff they can't explain. They have to go out on faith. But as you think about the Big Bang itself, let me share with you why I, as a scientist, don't put a whole lot of stock in it. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time here. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Supposedly, everything radiated out from a central explosion. So matter should be evenly dispersed, right? Interesting, because right now we know the sun is made up of 98% hydrogen and helium, and yet out of the first four planets, less than 1% of them are made up of hydrogen and helium. Folks, if we had a Big Bang explosion, somebody tell me how it is that all of the helium and hydrogen went to one place when everything should be evenly distributed. By the way, maybe somebody can explain why Jupiter is still giving off twice as much heat as it's receiving from the sun. Allegedly, this Big Bang happened billions of years ago. It should have long cooled off. And yet the reality is we've got NASA photographing volcanic eruptions on the moons. We know Ganymede, for instance, has got a, a molten metal core. You know what that tells me? It tells me it hasn't cooled off yet. It's not billions of years old. In fact, here's the best way for me to describe it to you. Guys, imagine the following scenario, okay? You go home tonight, your wife has cooked your favorite homemade cookies, right? She pulls them out of the oven. She sets them up on top. You go to grab one. She smacks your head. She says, no, nah, not yet. They haven't cooled off yet. 
So you just sit there, you know, drools coming down your face, and you look at her and say, how long? She says, oh, they should be cool in about 18 billion years. <laughs> Jupiter should have long cooled off by now. In fact, I want to share with you a, a quote from a guy. He's an astronomer named Bob Berman. He was writing to his fellow astronomers, okay? He's writing in the journal Astronomy. He said that there should be a warning place before every article that talks about the Big Bang. Take a look at what his warning says. Warning, the following contains contemporary cosmology. Reading it can produce disorientation and confusion. Nobody knows what's going on, and nothing you read here is likely to be true. Now, that's one astronomer writing to his fellow astronomers. How do we present it in a textbook? It's fact, right? Let's get back to that question. Could God have used the Big Bang to get us to where we are today? Folks, all you need are the first two verses of the Bible. If you got a Bible or a smartphone or something, you might open it up. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the surface of the waters. How does Moses describe the earth on that very first day? Well, ask yourself this question. What was the Spirit of God moving over? The waters, right? You know, we don't think about it this way very often, but this was a water-covered heavenly body. God hadn't brought forth land yet. Okay, do we know the boiling temperature of water? Yeah. yeah. Depending on which system you use, it's either 100 degrees or 212, right? Folks, allegedly that Big Bang happened at a temperature you and I can't fathom. In the billions of degrees. How in the world do you have a water-covered heavenly body on the same day you've got a billion-degree explosion? By the way, add to that this minor little problem, and that is, according to the Bible, the sun, the moon, the stars, they didn't come into the picture until day four. In fact, for those of you sitting out there who believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, but you're also trying to embrace evolution, let me point out one little problem you got. The Bible says the plants were here before the stars. How do you get a big bang that way? You see, you can't. Somebody says, well, wait a second. Maybe one of those days was millions of years. Maybe that's how we can do it. Okay, again, if you've got a Bible, you might open it up to Genesis chapter 1. Take a look with me at verse 5, verse 8, verse 13, verse 19, where Moses records over and over the same phrase. He says, evening and morning were the first day. Evening and morning were the second day. Notice what he's doing. He's defining it as an evening and a morning. And then he says, day one, day two, day three using a numerical adjective. Now look at verse 14. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. Folks, please listen to me. He gives you three elements of time in that one verse. Days, years, and seasons. If each one of these was not a 24-hour day as you and I recognize it, but rather millions of years, what is he talking about in verse 14 when he specifies days, years, and seasons? You look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Okay, what does that leave out? Nothing. But to me, the easiest way to answer this question right here if you are sitting here wondering, could each one of those days have been a long period of time? I'm the kind of guy, I like to keep it simple, okay? So, let me ask you this. That is a stargazer lily, okay? Color's not real great on the screen. I use that on purpose because my wife and I had those in our wedding, and I get brownie points, okay? If I asked you what day were those created, according to the Bible, they were created on day three. 
Now, that is the stargazer lily. What does it need in order to reproduce? Obviously, it's got to have water and it's got to have sunlight. We also know it's got to have the right atmosphere. It's got to have the right nutrients in the soil. But interesting, that's a stargazer lily. The only way that guy reproduces is if he's pollinated. Okay? All those flying insects, you know, those little honeybees that drive us crazy around this time of year? They, they do serve a purpose in God's greater plan, right? What day were all the flying creatures created on? Day five. Okay, so let's think about this. Are you really ready to say each one of these days was a million years? God put all the flowering plants here on day three. You had to wait two million years before they could be pollinated? Folks, that's illogical. Besides the fact that the plants wouldn't have made it. And somebody right about now is sitting in there thinking to themselves, yeah, but, but the Bible says, you know, a day of the war is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. I know that's in there somewhere. <laughs> and it is. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But before I let you rip that horribly out of context and drop it in the creation account, we got to ask a couple of questions. Number one, what was he talking about in 2 Peter chapter 3? Remember, the people were getting impatient. They wanted to know, when's he coming back? He said, look, God doesn't count time the way you do. Day to him is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. Second question, is that going to give you enough time? So what do you mean? Folks, it's a six-day creation. That would only be 6,000 years. A day is like a thousand. You need billions to fit evolution. Number three, third problem. The word day in 2 Peter 3, 8 is the same exact word that we find when we talk about Jesus Christ being in the tomb for three days and three nights. Anybody want to put him in the tomb for 3,000 years? Or how about Jonah in the belly of a fish? Same word. Anybody want to put him in the belly of a fish for 3,000 years? Imagine what he'd smell like. <laughs> you see, it's interesting to me. We don't want to stretch out the time Jonah's in a fish or Christ is in the tomb. But everybody wants to try to figure out how can we stretch out Genesis chapter 1? Because after all, surely those scientists can't be wrong. Folks, that's the wrong attitude. At some point, we got to realize and we got to start teaching our kids Surely the inspired word of God is not ever wrong. <laughs> Man, we've been wrong a bunch. Ask George Washington. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't because we bled him to death. Because we thought bleeding out somebody would actually cure him. George Washington gets sick. He goes, believe it or not, barbershops, that blue, red, white, blue pole, strike pole. That used to be a sign for a place where you could get bled. He goes, he gets bled out. Guess what? It didn't help him. So what did they do? They bled him again. And he died. Oops. Sometimes man doesn't know as much as he thinks. By the way, if you're still sitting in here thinking you can join evolution and creation, please understand the Bible says very plainly it was water first, then land. It's not what evolution says. Evolution says it was land first, then water. By the way, have you ever asked yourself, where did the water come from? I mean, think about it. The Bible says very plainly, it's created on the first day. But where does it come from if evolution is true? You're right about now, somebody says, well, you know, the water cycle. We learned about it in junior high science. <laughs> You're absolutely right. The only problem with that is, in order to have a water cycle, you first gotta have what? Water. So where did it come from? Somebody says, well, you know, maybe the, all the molecules slamming together. That's interesting because we've never found it anywhere else. But you'll be happy to know if you are a skeptic this evening. About six years ago, five years ago, they discovered where the water came from. They learned that allegedly all the Earth's water was delivered by meteorites. Now, I didn't know meteorites were in the water delivery business. 
Think about how much water you'd have to deliver to cover 75% of this earth. Oh, and by the way, what happens to a meteorite when it hits our atmosphere? What would happen to the water? You see, they don't even have an answer. And yet, over and over, what do they say? We see statements like this one. Was your ancestor a sea spawn? This is your ancestor. Okay, that may be their ancestor. It's not mine. <laughs> and yet, our kids, they run off to school, they read about the geologic column. All those different layers. I had a guy, he came and we were talking about this. I said, do you know about the geologic column? He literally, he, he recited it top to bottom. He said, yeah, we've been tested on it. I said, well, did they actually tell you how it was made? He said, no, they didn't tell us that. I said, I didn't think so, because the geologic column was actually fashioned in the 1800s based almost solely on assumptions. Because you see, in the 1800s, they didn't have any idea about how fast canyons could be formed or, or those different stridal layers. Well, 33 years ago, all of our assumptions were blown away quite literally. 33 years ago, Mount St. Helens erupted, almost 34 at this point. For those of you sitting out there wondering, was it really 34 years ago? Yes, you are that old, okay? June 1980, that thing exploded. And with it, all of the assumptions that we thought we knew, quite literally, they just kind of vanished away. Suddenly, we started learning all kinds of new things. Here you see a, a picture of Mount St. Helens on May the 18th. And you can tell it's just about to blow. By the way, at this point, here's what was happening. The girth of this thing, it was growing 15 to 35 feet per day the week before it exploded. So if you look at a little bit of time motion, here's what's happening. Mountain starts to literally slough off one side. When it does that, it actually kind of, it was like taking a, the top off of a coat. All the pressure that had been up under there, suddenly you, you pull the top. It's kind of like taking a coat first and shaking it up and then taking the top off. Because what happened very soon thereafter is a massive explosion. An explosion that literally and North America has not been touched since then. My son and I, we were there on the 30th anniversary. And I want to share with you very quickly five things that we've learned from Mount St. Helens using the acronym SUPER, S-U-P-E-R. Please understand, this is the most highly studied volcano of all time. It's a living laboratory. The S, the S is for those striatal layers. You see on the screen, again, the, the column, all the different layers. You've got the Cambrian period, the Carboniferous period. Each one of them, allegedly, over millions and millions of years. So we see something like this. This is a, a rock bluff about 120 feet. The reason I know that, my son and I, we stood right down here. And if you look at it carefully, you see all the different layers in there. On top, you see what evolution is called sedimentary rock, they would say that's over 100 million years old. The only problem is everything you're looking at was put down in about a matter of a week after the initial explosion. In fact, we got video proof of this one right here. All of the sediment, all of the layers below this first yellow line was put down in the initial eruption, May the 18th, 1980. There was a secondary eruption, June the 20th put down everything between the two yellow lines, March the 19th of 82, everything on top. You say, Brad, what's your point? My point is everything you're looking at was put down in just two years. And by the way, if you were born before May the 18th, 1980, you're older than those rocks. You think about that for just a moment. I have people all the time that say, you know, but Brad, the rocks, they look so old. I'm like, what does a young rock look like? You know, it's not like they come out with a pacifier and diapers. 
Those rocks. By the way, I got a friend who actually took samples from the dome cap of Mount St. Helens. Okay, the dome cap is the new stuff that forms over after it cools. He had them dated. We knew exactly when the dome cap was put on there. The dating, 1.3 million years old. So the S is for rapid striatal layering. I, I discovered, I asked one of the guys while we were there, I said, you know, how are we getting this layering effect? He said, Brad, what happens if the pyroclastic flows, they, it's like taking a, br a broom over a tile floor. He said it leaves a little bit of sediment and then another flow will come over the top of that, it cools, another flow, it cools, and it leaves this layering effect. But again, please understand that can happen in a matter of days, not millions of years. The U is for upright logs. There is a lake on the north sector of Mount St. Helens called Spirit Lake. When the initial thing erupted, it quite literally flushed all of the timbers on the local ridges of the mountains straight into Spirit Lake, stripped them of the branches. I mean, it was that powerful of an explosion. There's a floating mat of logs still there today. I mean, we flew over and I'll show you an aerial shot of it. At one point, basically the entire lake was covered over. A buddy of mine by the name of Dr. Steve Austin has done extensive research in Spirit Lake. You see his picture right there at the bottom of the screen. He's wearing scuba gear, his colleague beside him. He told me, he said, Brad, what we're seeing is these logs will float for several decades before the heavy root end finally sinks down. And he said they'll bob straight up and down for many, many years before they settle into the bottom of Spirit Lake, standing straight up. He actually showed me video footage of fish swimming between trees in the bottom of this lake. He said, Brad, this is what we're seeing from a catastrophe. And it's also exactly what we see from the fossil record. Take a look. On the screen you see three men standing at the base of this rock bluff. Those are five fossilized trees. But you'll notice those trees are going through several different layers. Folks, how, how does that happen? If each one of those layers is put down over millions of years, how do you have trees that are going up through several different layers? It'd be one thing if there was only one of these examples. They're literally all over the world. My family and I, we were up in Nova Scotia last year, a place called the Fundy Bay. Joggins Cliff. It's, it's a place where water goes in and out quicker than any other bay in the world. They've got all kinds of these polystrate fossils. Fossils that are extending through several different layers. Again, how do you explain that if each one of those layers was put down over a certain amount of time? I mean, am I to believe that that tree grew up through the rock? Or did that tree just wait around millions of years while the rock formed around it? Folks, if you're a dead tree, what are you going to do? Decay and rot, right? Again, we've got these literally all over the world. So the U is for upright laws. The P is for peak formation. While we were there, we took a... Uh, a helicopter ride into the volcano all, all over the area and you can see from this shot an aerial of Spirit Lake you see the, the floating log map these are all original logs from that initial explosion interesting if you go down there to it one of the things you'll notice there's not a stitch of bark on any of those logs and the reason being they've been bumping together for 30 years They've been rubbing each other. All the bark is in the bottom of Spear Lake. In fact, my buddy Steve Austin, he, he showed me evidence of these, basically what they were calling peat beds, several feet thick. He said, Brad, what's happening is the bark is tr being transformed into peat. He said, we found peat literally five, eight, nine feet deep. 
And you look at him and you say, so what? Who cares? Folks, peat is a precursor for making coal. They're making coal literally during the lifetime of men in the bottom of Spirit Lake. How are they doing it? You got pressure from the water. You got heat from the volcano. And you got peat from the bark. You know, they always told us it took 250 million years to lay down coal. Now, we know that's not the case today. The E is for rapidly eroding caves. Now, if I didn't tell you anything at all about this picture, aside from the fact that these canyons are about 600 feet deep, you might assume that that river carved the canyon. And the reality? Those canyons were formed in about two days. And the reason I know that for sure, when we got into the blast zone, one of the things we noticed, the volcano itself, when it erupted, it didn't go just straight up. You might remember from those images I showed you, actually this whole side of the mountain basically slid down. Right before it did that, the snow, the ice in that area slid down into this valley. Everything came pouring out, lava comes out. What do you think happens to snow and ice when it comes in contact with lava? It melted quickly, turned into steam, and it blew steam vents 600 feet deep in two days. Now, folks, think about that for just a moment. We're told canyons are formed over millions and millions of years. In fact, let me see a show of hands. How many of you in here were, remember being taught that the Colorado River carved out the Grand Canyon? Anybody? Most of you. Okay, let's see if we can learn something real quick. We know, in fact, the Grand Canyon exists. That's a fact. We also know there's two different interpretations. Evolutionists would have you believed it was carved slowly over a long period of time, a little bit of water. Creationists say, wait a second, time out. We got a living laboratory at Mount St. Helens that showed it can be formed quickly with a lot of water over a little amount of time. The problem is evolutionists are wanting to erase the line between what is a fact and what is their interpretation. So our kids are constantly reading things like Colorado rivers cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. Well, if you don't remember anything else from this lesson, Please remember this, that river had absolutely nothing to do with carving out the canyon. And here's how I know that. That river enters the canyon at an elevation of 2,800 feet. Scientific fact, you can't refute it. You want to check me? Take a GPS, stand right about here where it enters the canyon. You're going to be at an elevation of 2,800 feet. The south rim, the area that everybody loves to look at and go, oh, that's beautiful, is sitting over here at 6,900 feet. In order for this river to have carved that canyon, it means water would have had to flow uphill about 4,000 feet in elevation. Now, folks, I'm not a hydrologist, but I do know this. I do know water seeks the lowest level, doesn't it? That river did not carve the canyon. In fact, think about this. If it carved the canyon, where's the delta? Like all the stuff that's in there. And oh, by the way, why are there so many side canyons? Could a global flood do it? Yeah, that could do it. The R is for rapid recovery. We took this shot about three minutes in the very first day inside the blast zone, and you can see stuff's back. In fact, the elk were some of the first things to come back. <coughs> elk have very, very tough hooves, and what they were discovering is the elk would get out and they would walk across the, the lava flows that had hardened. They had that, that gray ash that had basically turned into this rock. They go across it, they break up the lava flows, and then the elk do what elk do. They fertilize. And all of a sudden, more and more life starts coming back. <laughs> Interesting. When this thing first blew, we were getting pictures like this one. Where they went in, they looked at it, 
I, it looked like a blast zone had gone off. I mean, literally, like a, a nuclear bomb. There was no life anywhere. And the scientists said, take about 60,000 years for everything to come back. And then they downgraded and said, well, it might take about 30,000. Okay? That's 30 years to the day. And it's back. See, they were using an evolutionary time scale. Now, I, I want you to think about this for just a minute. Put on your thinking cap. If you look carefully, you'll notice that's a blank slate. I mean, everything's dead. No vegetation. No animal life. It's all dead. Folks, if evolution is true, somebody please help me understand why didn't we evolve new plants and animals in that blank zone? It's a blank slate. So why didn't we get new stuff? <laughs> like mice with Kevlar umbrellas. Volcano proof. I'll tell you why we didn't. Because this is a fairy tale. But they use it to teach our kids an old age. In fact, if I were to ask you what's the one thing they got to have lots and lots of? Got to have lots and lots of time. I'll show you, this is from a teacher's edition. Notice what I highlighted. It says, stress at the earth is thought to be at least 4.5 billion years old. Why would we stress that? Because without that much time, their theory is not getting off the ground. I I'm going to share with you very quickly before I let you take a break, just a couple of shots just to kind of solidify what I've been talking about. We look all over the world and we see terrain that the only way you can really explain this kind of curvatures, these kind of, is if the earth was basically upheaved. Which, oh, by the way, it was in the global flood. Which makes sense when you start seeing things curve back on itself. And yet we see that literally all across the planet. Somebody says, okay, wait a second, Brad, hold on. Before you, before you go there, I, you know, we went on vacation, and, and while we were on vacation, we saw these coal deposits being loaded onto trains. And, and you know, we, we've always known it takes a long time for coal, right? If I asked you, what does it take to make coal? Most people would say vegetation, lots of heat, lots of pressure. But does it really take millions of years? Now, in fact, we've known that for a long time. I actually was reading, I've got a bunch of slides that I don't use. Have a, a slide where it talks about them being able to make a, a chunk of coal in 30 days in a laboratory. The reason we don't use that to heat your house is because it's terribly expensive to make it. But here you've got J.D. Saxby saying, hey, we can do this within several years. He says several years are sufficient for the generation of oil and gas from suitable precursors. He say several thousand years? Several million years? You see folks, how do you explain finding things like this bell inside a lump of coal? If coal was laid down 250 million years ago, that means this bell was around before the dinosaurs. Maybe they used it to ring the dinner bell. Or maybe the Bible gives us a lot better explanation. Genesis chapter 4 verse 22 talks about Tubal Cain and instructor of every craftsman of brass and iron. But it is not just a bell. They found things like necklaces in coal. Or let's get a little closer to home. What about Oklahoma? The electrical plant where they found this cast iron pot in coal. Or maybe we can talk about this vessel. Supposedly, it was in something that's 600 million years old. Again, what we're seeing is the evidence isn't supporting their theory. You say, but Brad, you know, surely you, you understand things have to be old because... 
When we went to one of the Carlsbad Caverns, for instance, we saw these beautiful stalactites and the park ranger told us you can't touch those because the oil from your finger will slow down that process and it takes millions of years. Have you ever been told something like that? Oh yeah. In fact, it says tiny drops of water over millions of years. Does it really take, like, we know these things exist today, but does it really take millions of years for instance, that's the Lincoln Memorial, built in 1922. That picture was taken in the 1960s. Or we can talk about a lead mine in Australia that has stalactites hanging from a switch side. There's stalactites hanging from the man-made. Or we can talk about, surely you don't think indoor plumbing's been around for millions of years, right? This one's my favorite. There's a place in Europe, if you ever get over to England, go to a place called Mother Shipton's Cave. You can go there, you can tie off a, a teddy bear, a hat, a, a favorite trinket, come back in just a, a couple of days, few weeks, and it has been completely encased like a stalagmite. Notice I didn't say years, a couple of days. Or how about this one? That's a, a bat encased in a stalagmite. Now, you just got to ask yourself, did that tiny little bat sit there on the top of that thing while tiny drops of water hit him in the back over millions of years? Or is it possible we've been sold a bad deal of goods? Because you see, it really does exist. It's just their dating method doesn't fit. You say, but okay, Brad, I, I hear what you're saying, but... You still haven't explained those dinosaurs. You know, the dinosaurs, didn't they live millions and millions of years ago? Find out you're going to have to come back in about 10 minutes.